Rodriguez, thank you very much for making some time today. Appreciate it. Most welcome. So I want to start with, you're, you're born in Tanzania, you're educated in India and in England. How do you then come to Newfoundland and become so passionate and engaged in rural Newfoundland? Well, I have always wanted to go to the Canadian North, would you believe it? But uh, I had a friend uh, who had come to Newfoundland and uh, married a girl in Newfoundland and uh, he was a little bit lonely, I think, and he asked me to come and visit him. So I came to visit him for one month. Uh, I had it, things lined up in Bavaria, in Bahamas, and in Zambia. And I came here, but I fell in love with the people here. And uh, it was a great place to bring up children. And uh, I just liked the work. So we decided to stay for six months. And then one year, and it's now nearly our 35th year. So we're not going anywhere now. <laughs> Now, you came, you set up your, your dentistry practice, but at the end of the day, you didn't come home and shut the door and say, that's my job done. You were involved in municipal politics as the mayor and the deputy mayor, volunteered on numerous, uh, numerous other community projects. What is it about uh, being engaged in a community that's so appealing to you? I think that Newfoundland was extremely good to me. My professional life was full and very rewarding and I wanted to give back to the community what uh, what I could. So there was a lot glaring opportunity and need for further employment and utilization of, uh, of the resources around us. So I became involved with uh, the council. I was a councillor, deputy mayor, mayor, and I was chairman of the Community Futures. And we did a lot of work in community economic development. Uh, because there are phenomenal opportunities in this province. There were, there are, and there will be. And I think uh, we did not have enough people jumping into the foray and taking a leadership role. Uh, now there are more people, but at that time I think there were not too many people. Now you've got an entrepreneurial spirit <coughs> in you. You started off with uh, the first of, I guess, of what we'll call the new age sort of mink farms back in, in uh, the early 80s. And then you said you set up a pharmacy. And then finally, a dentist decides, okay, I'm going to go into winemaking. How did that come about? Well, so some friends of mine who were originally in the mink ranching business asked me to help them out. Uh, they thought I was extremely wealthy, you know, and I'm not, but. Anyway, they thought so, but I helped them get into back into mink ranching, and we were very successful. Eventually, I ended up owning the the mink ranch, but I sold it. I'm not a rancher; I'm I'm, I'm a dentist, so I sold that, and uh, then we straight away went into an opportunity that presented itself. We had a new clinic built in Whitburn, and uh, I thought it would be wonderful to have a drugstore right next to it. So we had a drugstore, and it was very successful, and we sold that. But then, uh, through my contacts with the community economic development and community futures, we found that blueberries were a tremendous asset in this province, and yet nobody was further processing and adding value. So I tried to encourage people to do it, but nobody was doing it. So you have to put your money where your mouth is, you know. So I decided, well, I'll make wine. I just resurrect a tradition that was prevalent in Newfoundland many years ago before we joined Confederation. So now I made wine, I had some friends who helped me make wine. We did a feasibility study, it came out 98% in favor, and I got into making wine. And uh, we, I, I made 500 cases, kind of illegally, because I didn't have a license then. And I couldn't sell the wine because I didn't have a license. But then Paul Dick became uh, Minister of Finance and he gave me a license very quickly. And we sold 500 cases in, in uh, about 10 days. And the next day we sold 3,500 cases. And it went on to 5, 10, 12, and we are at 17,000 cases now. And very soon we'll be making vodka and our contract with the company in Iceland would probably take us to about 50,000 cases. You started all that in 1993? Yes, yes. We started, uh, I bought the old cottage hospital that was decommissioned and totally vandalized. I got it. I brought it back to life. I made wine. I left my practice at about 5 o'clock in the evening. 
swallowed down my supper and was there at the winery at the Old College Hospital till about 12 o'clock. So what have you learned from that business? What has that taught you? Well, it, it led me to further opportunities because uh, we were only using about uh, 150,000 pounds of uh, berries and uh, that led me to believe that these berries are extremely good. We have the top-notch berries in this province and we're still not really further processing to any high level. So I wanted to utilize as much of the berries as possible in this province so I did a feasibility study for a nutraceutical plant and these nutraceuticals will come from blueberries and cranberries and partridge berries and other berries that we will grow in this province such as Sibalkthon and the feasibility study came in very strong in favor of it so we did a pilot plant and it cost us about two and a half million dollars to do the pilot plan and the proof of concept just to prove all the technologies and we have leading edge technologies that are second to none in the world and we are doing some pre-commercialization that will lead us into a full plant in the next short while. So talk about, um, first of all, just tell people what nutraceuticals are if you wouldn't mind. Well yes, nutraceuticals are really, you know, food uh, sort of a, in a changed form that actually we extract all the nutrients and we put them in a form that is more concentrated. So they're really foods, natural foods uh, in a more concentrated form. Like we take blueberries and we dehydrate them in a very good technology that does not diminish their nutritional value and those become uh, nutritional powders that can be added in, in drinks and in beverages in foods and can be eaten in, uh, can be consumed in tablets or in capsules. So these are all nutrients, foods from nature with no chemicals. And you see nutraceuticals and this company as a way to revitalize and, and sort of grow rural Newfoundland. Talk to me about that. Well, we had this vision, I had this vision of uh, developing this nutraceutical plant that would employ uh, 80 people in the plant, 80 full-time jobs, that would be f almost forever. And uh, the spin-off from this would be that we would have about 200 farmers in this province pulling fruit, growing fruit for a dedicated buyer. Uh, so we would have possibly about 280 to 300 people kind of involved with us. This is a tremendous opportunity for rural Newfoundland because there's very little going on in rural Newfoundland right now. And I think uh, people in the small communities can actually grow very successfully some of the crops that I mentioned and make a very good living and may not have to move out of their communities and I think this is, uh, I feel very passionate about this that it can be done and uh, I, would like to ha I would like to see it happen in the next very short while. Now you also mentioned um, to me earlier in our conversation that um, you see seaweed as playing a key, so it's not just berries, but also what's, what's in the ocean. Oh yes, I mean we have a phenomenal amount of seaweed around this province that is relatively unused at the moment. Uh, we have very small concentration. We are working, we have developed a technology of drying this seaweed without uh, any loss of nutrients. And we have a company in St. John's that is actually working and making, turning them into cosmetics. And as a matter of fact, this company went to New York recently and uh, did some really phenomenal sales of products coming from the sea that we had uh, dehydrated and powderized and made into a form that she can use in her cosmetics and as a food. And also, she also took our fruit powders, which are phenomenal. They retain 94% of the nutrients and you can put them in a, cell, in, a, in a bag and you can put them on a shelf and they will last five to eight years without any loss of nutrients. So this is much better than actually fresh frozen product. It can stay on the shelf for eight to ten years. You know. Now natural Newfoundland nutraceuticals, your, your company, you've got a lot of the preliminary work done there, a lot of the investments in there, but it's, it's still not fully launched. What's preventing that from happening? We need uh, um, investors. We need investors and we need uh, to bring in more capital uh, because the plant will cost uh, around uh, $8 million. We have already spent $2.5 but we need $8 million 
to bring the plant up to a level that it can be highly commercial and we will be in the global market. We are not really concentrating on Newfoundland as such or Canada as such. We are in the global market. Today, if we want to be successful, we have to be at the leading edge of technology and we have to be in the global market because all countries are developing products. So you have to be a leader. Otherwise, I think you'll be left in the dust. So we have leading edge technologies. They are expensive but they are terrific in the sense that they give you the best nutrient value and uh, for that we need uh, investors right now. And you think that we have more of a challenging time here in Newfoundland and Labrador of drawing those venture capitalists because we we're not Ontario and Quebec. We don't have those folks and you also think that we we don't have the business acumen to speak to that, would you? Well, what happens is uh, in Quebec and in Ontario and other parts of Canada, you have industries and you have businesses like, uh, not similar to us, but in, in the general area of ours, uh, and you have venture capitalists close to them who can oversee them and, and can be part of them. There seems to be a shortage of investors who are interested in coming to Newfoundland and even less so outside St. John's. So it's very, very difficult to get any investors to invest in any sizable way outside, past the overpass, shall we say. Uh, it's very difficult and as such, we need a different form of uh, venture capital that has to be homegrown. What role can the, can the provincial government play in that? I think uh, the provincial government has to assume the role of the venture capitalists for a period of time. I'm not saying forever, I'm just saying for a period of time, for let's say about eight to ten years. And uh, once the venture capitalists see that the businesses and the entrepreneurs in Newfoundland and Labrador are doing well, they will gain confidence in actually coming and uh, being part of businesses in the whole of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, they will have no aversion to coming to rural Newfoundland. Do you think there's a vision there to, to revitalize? Is there a plan that's going to look after rural Newfoundland and Labrador? I think, you know, everybody is looking at the problem and uh, they only see a problem. And uh, I think you've got to look at solutions. You know, it, it's like this big bear sitting in the middle of this room and we're all dancing around it. Uh, what we need to do is to have an intention, you know. We have to have an intention that we are going to have a biotechnology sector in this province and uh, we're going to utilize all the resources that are available in this province, like our berry crops, like our seaweed, like uh, you know all the fruits that can be grown in this province and further process them to the nth degree and into all these wonderful products that the global market is really looking for. And most consumers are looking for new products, high energy products